Welcome to a special edition of our Friday Feature Artist Interview Series. It's with great excitement and honour that we once again welcome Debbie Lydon, an extraordinary artist and educator, to be our featured artist. Today is particularly special as we focus on the captivating inspiration behind Debbie's art and introduce you to her signature online course with Fibre Arts Take Two, Sensing Place, a Material Response. So what makes Debbie's work so special? I'm glad you asked. Living and creating by the sea in Norfolk, in a charming old fishing town of Wales next to the sea, her work embodies the light, weather, water and sound of her natural surroundings. Through her unique perspective, Debbie transforms these elements into stunning drawings, mixed media cloths, sculptures and installations. Her approach, deeply inspired by the traditional methods used by sailors to protect their sails and gear, beautifully links the historical and utilitarian use of cloth with the materiality of the coastal environment that she calls home. Originally trained as a classical musician at the Royal Academy of Music, Debbie's artistic practice is a symphony of the senses, aiming to evoke a multi-sensory interpretation of the landscape. This profound connection with nature, marked by themes of impermanence, change and degeneration, is not only a source of inspiration, but also the central motif for her work. Debbie's pieces originate from a place of deep observation and curiosity, from the simple act of walking, noticing and collecting, to the thoughtful reflection on the memories and experiences that shape our perception of place. And now, Debbie is here to share her process, techniques and inspiration with you in her signature online course with Fibre Arts Take Two. Whether it be an urban city or coastal town, this is a unique opportunity to tap into the sensory riches of your environment and create art that resonates with meaning and personal significance. As Debbie states, you'll be amazed at what opening your senses can do for your art practice. Today's interview is an invitation to explore and engage and the opportunity to relish in a fresh perspective by connecting with your surroundings in ways you might never have imagined. As we discuss the core principles of Sensing Place, a material response, and uncover how this course can revolutionise your approach to art, we invite you to join us, ask questions and engage with Debbie. And if you're watching on the replay, please feel free to leave a question or comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. So without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to Debbie Lydon as our 122nd Friday Feature Artist. Hello, Debbie. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I'm really excited to speak to you all. Yeah. Um, whether it's the evening or the morning or the afternoon, wherever you are. Yep. Well, it's certainly early here. The sun is not up yet, but I will get out of bed for you. <laughs> yeah, evening here as well. So yeah, <laughs> we managed to meet somewhere across the time, across the way. time zone. Yes. I, I tell you, we've got so many people watching from all over the world and I'll pop a few names up. Hello, Christine. Hi, Eva. Great to see you. We've got Gisela from Germany. Hello, Maria. Lovely to see you. Um, Canada. Hi, Jan. Susan, Rhode Island. So exciting. It is just so lovely to see everybody. Um, and of course, to do a live Friday Feature Artist. We've had a few uh, pre-records lately, so it's lovely to be back in the studio. So um, welcome, everybody. Hi, Fiona. So nice to see you. Um, so everyone, this is your opportunity to ask Debbie as many questions as we can get through. Um, and of course, as usual, I have prepared pre-asked questions as well so that we can get, um, yeah, get the ball rolling. So Debbie, yeah. come back from Scotland. How, how was your three days up there? Um, exhausting. It's 10 hours drive up, two days <laughs> there and 10 hours drive down. So um, it was lovely to go up and see my son there who I hadn't seen for a few months. Um, there was snow. It was quite cold, 
Um, yeah, minus minus five, I think, on one evening when we went out. And um, yeah, so um, icy as well. And uh, yeah, bright sunshine, though. So we managed to get out for a couple of walks, which was really lovely. And just a nice wow. have a little break before this all kicks off in the next week or so. So that's yeah. Cool. That's right. Yeah, fantastic. Well, your work is profoundly influenced by your place and where you live, being Norfolk, uh, North Norfolk um, in the UK. And it's this beautiful, beautiful town called Wells next to the sea, which we were lucky to film at. But how does travelling to a different location, like, does it affect your art practice at all? Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, obviously, when I travel around and I go and experience other places, I'm still experiencing them. So I'm still looking at them. I'm still listening. I'm still touching. I'm still actually um, looking at the, the experience of the thing rather than just looking and drawing. So I'm trying to take that whole sensory experience as I um uh, work in another place. But what I don't have when I go somewhere else is that deep knowledge that I have of the place that I have here in Norfolk. So when I'm in Norfolk and I look out and I can see maybe um, a place a mile away, I, I've been to that place and I know what that place looks like from near, from near to as well as from far away. I can probably name that place and um, I can understand how the water moves around that place. I can understand where the wind's coming from. I, I understand the direction of where I am. So I am always very well orientated north, south, east, west, where I am. But if I go away and I look at something, I don't necessarily know what it's called. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know it from the perspective of um, I'm there, and I'm looking back towards where I'm presently standing, if you can understand what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, so there's, so, so I don't have that deep knowledge when I go away, but that doesn't mean that I can't still um, sense the place and experience the place and get a lot from it. And of course, if I go back to the same place over and over and over again, I get more experiences and I have gained more knowledge. And so uh, the, the knowledge I get is becomes deeper really. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes. <laughs> Good. Amazing. One of the things I found with being at your location was the where you live in Norfolk is just the, the variation in what you get from one day to another. And I've got some beautiful photos here. Um, this actually was an image that we took from a drone and that was at sunset, uh, sorry, sunrise. Yeah, and and it was just we had this most glorious morning filming. We were so, so lucky to be. I'll, I'll um, honestly never forget that in my life. But then the following day, at the same time, it looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a really misty, foggy day, didn't we, the next day? Yes. So not only were we incredibly lucky, but it just shows that contrast. It was just, it was, you just think that when you wake up like in a glorious morning like that, you think that that's the way this place will always be. But the next day, amazing. That's right. I think that's very typical of, you know, of England, you know, the UK for a start. I think things change much more quickly than maybe if you're in the, in the, in the middle of a big continent and um, the weather perhaps doesn't change in quite such in quite the same way. I know if we go up to the Scottish islands, if to the islands, the weather changes even more quickly and yeah. also living on the edge of a place. So in on the coastline, I think the weather changes more um, um, frequently than perhaps in the middle of the in the middle of the UK. So, yeah, we, we have a lot of changing elements where we are. Yeah. Mm. Another thing as well, speaking of that, is the tides. So your studio looks out um, onto the East Hills and the tide rises, like the tidal range there is, is massive over the marshes. We've got a little time lapse that we took from the back of Debbie's studio because we wanted to show people... Um, we were just fascinated by it. So it goes for 38 seconds. So I'm going to play that now for people. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see this. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Look at that. That's I amazing. Love boats, yeah. I love how the boats turn, you know, they're going one way and then they turn. That's right. And then when the tide goes the other way, they'll turn back the other way as the tide comes in. 
Yeah, so the tide's going out now. And the marsh is revealed. It's quite unusual for the marsh to be completely covered with water. It's only covered um, twice in a month when we have spring tides, which are the big tides that come up and cover everything. Yeah. So we saw that, you know, twice a day almost, and it was just, yeah, it was just beautiful. What a, what a location. Yeah. Well, Debbie, we're here today to not only talk about your art practice, which is going to be fantastic and people can ask questions, um, but we're also here to have a look at actually what we filmed and what the course um, Sensing Place entails. Um, so I'd love to kick us off and this is also something that you've never seen. So oh, yes. I'm a little nervous to show you. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I've just watched year, hours and hours of videos. So um, I'm used to seeing myself on, on screen now, so it might not be too bad. So, yeah, so we'd love to share with you, everybody, um, our main trailer, our main showreel for Debbie's course. And this is also the first time she's seen it. So, okay, here we go. Sound is invisible. To visualize sound, you're visualizing the invisible. You have to use your imagination. You have to think about how you envisage it in your own mind. You'll be amazed what opening your ears does to your art practice. This course is going to help you become more creative because you're going to have to consciously listen to everything that's going on around you. It's about looking, listening and touching to create things that have never been thought of before. What I'm going to encourage you to do is to go out into the landscape and to sense what's going on, to experience what's going on it's using the sense of sight, the sense of sound and the sense of touch. And then you're going to come back and we visualize things, make marks and do drawings and stitch. I want you to think about how you interpret that landscape to actually make the marks on the cloth or the paper. You need lots of different techniques quite often to be able to interpret what you're experiencing. So I'm giving you lots of different techniques and a lot of those you'll never have used before. I'm sort of giving you everything that I do. What I would like to teach you is how to use materials in a way that you wouldn't normally use them, encouraging students to push themselves to do things that are not traditionally thought as being the norm. I hope you're going to be coming up with ideas that you've never had before. You're going to be playing with materials that you've never used before. And so therefore, I hope that you're going to end up with work that you've never made before as well. I'm very much looking forward to the way you, the students, are going to tell me what I could do, as well as me encouraging you to go out and find those things. We travel quite a long way. We start the course by scribbling and we end the course with phenomenology. This is quite a wide ranging workshop and so there's bound to be something for everybody there. You can work through it at your own speed. You would end up with a fantastic body of work that expresses you and your environment and your own personal ideas. The end of this course is actually the beginning of your journey. That's the point at which you can then bounce off and I hope that you will take some of the ideas I've given you forwards into your own practice. I'm really looking forward to sharing my landscape with you so that you can experience yours in a new way. I hope you can join me. I hope you like it. Quite cheerful. <laughs> this is wonderful. Yes. It just 
succinct and puts it all in a nutshell, which is just fantastic. And of course, I live in a very uh, photogenic place, so that helps things as well, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's an accumulation of a lot of work and um, Fleur Woods is with us tonight. She's another one of our beautiful tutors, so I'm sure she um, she totally understands how you feel right now after all that effort and, you know, years of putting it together and then the the, the really intense time we have filming and, yeah, that's beautiful. So, um, and it's certainly resonating with people, Gabby, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Susan, that's so lovely. Um, fantastic. So touching on that, your place, Debbie, what would you say to people who might be watching that and, you know, listening to what we've spoken about already saying, and they may be thinking to themselves, well, I don't live in such an inspiring place, or they may think they don't. Um, you know, I live in a in an apartment in the city. Um, how can, like, how can they be influenced so deeply by their place? Ah, good question. So, um, well, of course, I live in Wells now, and it is indeed a very inspiring place to live it's very beautiful and I just have to step outside my front door every day and I think wow there's so much to inspire but I didn't always live in Wales all the time I lived in southwest London in the suburbs um, for a long time my husband was working in London my children were at school and we only came up to Wales just for the holidays so indeed I've spent a lot of time um actually in the city in the town um, and I've had to make work because of that as well and again it's the same thing it's getting to know your environment um, quite often if you're just walking around and you're not paying you're not consciously paying attention to what's going on around you you don't get to know it but um, if you're actually going out and you're walking and you're looking at what's going around you become to know you get to know your place really well and in the past, I've looked at things that are not seashells, they're not seaweed, it's not, not beautiful water rippling in and out, but it's going to be marks in the concrete, it's going to be manhole covers, it's going to be those little squiggly marks you find in the tarmac on the road. And there's something to inspire wherever you are. I can remember doing one project on drain pipes, which is unbelievable, but it's quite amazing the way the paint in can the paint in the on the drain pipe can um degenerate and change and the sun and the rain can make it all change so wherever you are whether you're in a city in an apartment the main thing is that you're going to be going outside and you're going to be looking at your environment the place where you live and the common factor with all of us is that we are in the outside we are going outside and wherever you are there's going to be weather there's going to be rain there's going to be wind there are going to be factors that are going to change that environment and what will make each of our work um, personal or distinct is that you will have different objects, you'll have different materials, and they're all interest, they're all of interest. Whatever, wherever you are, you'll be able to pull things out of your environment and that you will be able to then make work from those things. So it doesn't matter where you live. Um, it, it can be photogenic, it can be less photogenic, but whatever it is, it still has a lot of interest to you. And of course, it's the place that you live in. And so it's personal to you. And I just think this is a good, a great opportunity for you to go out and understand that place a little bit more. There we go. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That's beautiful. And I know you mentioned that we started the course with a scribble, but in fact, things actually start with a walk as well. Oh, yeah, lots of walking. Yes, good. Yeah. There was a concept that you taught us and you taught us many concepts and through your inspirations, through other artists and um, poets and writers, and um, it was amazing throughout and they're scattered throughout the course. But you started with one from Hamish Fulton and he said, no work, no, now this is hard to say at 6 a.m. No walk, no work. <laughs> right, yes, no walk, no work. Thank yeah, you. Well, that's right. Well, he was a walking artist, so he went out into the environment, and actually, the artwork that he made was the walk. 
But we're sort of slightly changing that because we're going to be saying that unless you go out into the environment and do a walk, then you won't have anything to draw on, anything to evoke, any experiences um, to make work about. So indeed, if you don't go out and do a walk and experience and sense and document, you won't then have anything to make work about. You won't have anything to articulate um, in the long run. So yes, walking is going to be um, quite an important part of this course. And mm. it doesn't have to be you know, like a hike. It doesn't you have to go out for the whole day with a rucksack and your picnic. Um, it can just be 10 minutes here, half an hour there. Um, but what I'm really wanting everybody to do is to go out, experience and actually put yourself in the position where you sit still and look and listen and perhaps touch things as well. So walking is going to be important. There's a concept concept that you introduce us to called moments of being. Can you give us an example of what a moment of being is? And maybe you had one from even just a few days ago. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So to describe a moment of being, I first of all want to describe a moment of non-being. So a moment of non-being. So first of all, I ought to tell you where I got this idea from. So I got it from the writer Vita Sackville West. And she um, she was an English writer and um, she wrote um, uh, she wrote several essays. And one of her essays, she talks about a moment of being. And in that she talks about moments of non-being. So a moment of non-being is all that stuff that goes on in your life that you never really think about. So perhaps it will be, um, you know, just when you're doing the hoovering or when you're making dinner or driving the kids to school or it's, it's all that stuff that goes on um, that um, you never really think about. So that's a moment of non-being. So then on the reverse, a moment of being is um, a moment that sticks in your memory. So if you go out for a walk, it could be something that you weren't consciously looking for, but it's something that happens and that you get back home and you suddenly think, oh, oh, I can remember that. Oh, that's something that's more quite important to me. So I had a moment of being just the other day. I was, um, I go to choir, I sing in a choir, and I was driving, um, driving there. And just as I was driving, it was dusk, and a white owl, a barn owl flew very low, just over the road. They sort of swoop, and they seem to move quite slowly. So this barn owl swooped in front of me. And of course, that's a moment of being it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I was driving along, nothing was happening i wasn't really thinking about anything in particular but all of a sudden this is happening and of course that's something that's really stuck in my mind and just to have this white shadow flying across the road in front of me so a moment of being is um something that happens that sticks in your memory that um you will um uh, remember sometime afterwards really simple as that <laughs> How beautiful and what a magical moment having that. Really, actually, I always look out for barn owls um, and uh, you don't always see them because they're, they're, they're relatively rare. So it was nice to um, nice to see it. Yeah, gorgeous. One way you capture moments when you're out on your walks is through your sketchbooks. And I just think watching you out there and and working was 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 an amazing experience. But then also the simplicity behind the words and how you document what you're seeing. And I've got some examples there. Can you can you tell um, people about how you capture these moments um, in your sketchbook? Okay, so, um, right, so I do a lot of drawing, obviously. Um, that's the traditional way of doing things. Uh, people will take out a sketchbook and they will draw. But uh, personally, I find that writing is very often the way into making a piece of work. So um, for me, I will write lists. I will write um, just words. I will write sentences. I'll write. I'll just write things down as I see them, not in a poetic way. Um, I don't try and, and, and write, you know, something very beautiful while I'm out there. I just write literally what I see. It's a stream of consciousness. It's just there um, in front of me. And I will write. And 
very often, as I said before, it's the writing that brings me into a piece of work. So I will write something and it will be trying to capture that moment that I'm um that is trying to capture the moment that I've written about that um, will make I'll make the piece of work about that. So the drawing then places me in the environment. So I then if I do a lot of drawing, it again makes me sit still. It makes me look. It makes me listen. It makes me um, <clears throat> consciously aware of what's going on around me, how the light's changing. Um, I've got a sketchbook here. Do you want do you want me to show you? A little bit. I've just, I've, I just got a, the sketchbooks on the shelf here. So, this was a sketchbook from when I was up in Scotland once, and I was just as I was saying that about the light changing. I thought, oh, I've, I've done a whole load of drawings. So, I was sitting on the on a hill, and and I was just change. I was drawing the changes in light as um beautiful as it was going through. Yeah, look at that. So, Literally, the sun was moving across the sky. The clouds were moving off across the sky and it was going dark light, dark light, sun shadow, sun shadow. And so I was just capturing that. So mm -hmm. by sitting there and, and documenting what I could see, that helped me um, think about how the light changes up there. But then I write, I write things. So, you know, I'll have um, quite a lot of writing. So, for instance, here... Um, let's have a look. Let's, that's rather long. I don't want to tell you all of that. Okay, I wrote. So this was something I was thinking about. I was sitting at another in another place at a lock, and it's in a big bowl, and the water's at the bottom, and there were trees coming all up the sides. And I wrote, and this was just a thought I had while I was sitting there, I wrote, there is an Icelandic artist, I can't remember his name at the moment, who talks about the valleys between mountains as voids. He describes how the void fills to become solid when it rains or snows. I was reminded of this sitting at the Green Loch, and that's where I was sitting up in the Cairngorms, and seeing the steep-sided bowl fill with shining rain. So I was sitting there and, and the bowl of the Loch and was suddenly suddenly started raining. And instead of being air, it was full of raindrops and wow. I sort of thought about that how actually that bowl is now not just air an empty space but it's actually full of rain so as you're sitting there sometimes thoughts pop into your head and as for thoughts pop into my head I like to jot them down in my sketchbook so I'm hoping that perhaps people will get into the um into the habit of doing that as well when they take their sketchbooks out absolutely and one of the things that pops up as a, as a bit of a struggle, a bit of a um, barrier for people is how to take those ideas and how to take those sketches from the sketchbook into a finished piece of work. How do you help students do that, Debbie, in relation to, well, this course? And I mean, you do it in your live workshops as well. Yeah. Well, that's a, it's a big, it's always a big issue. You know, we go out and we do a walk and we document something and it's then, ah, what do I do now? How do I, yeah. how do I change that? So in the workshop, I'm trying to, I've tried to structure it so that we work through, go out, document, write, and then we come back and we discuss how we can use some of those things. So some shapes or a line or maybe a piece of writing. We, we talk about how we can transpose those things or evoke those experiences in a piece of work. So, for instance, in the first module, we're looking. So we're going out and we're in particular looking at shapes and lines and colours. And we come back and we you go through your sketchbooks and you take some of those shapes, lines and colours. We're not trying to represent the landscape exactly, but we're just trying to evoke it with just something that um, inspired you at the time, maybe a moment of being. And so in the first workshop, we make paper collages. So that's very much a designy sort of thing. Uh, we stitch the paper, we do a lot of painting papers, which you may, have, may or may not have done. But there is that quite a small step from in the sketchbook to um, a, a, a collage. And then a bit later on in the workshop, when you've done learn some more techniques then you take that small um paper collage and then we can make them again in cloth and waxing them so in fact you're going from drawing to sketchbook to um 
choosing some uh, shapes and what have you to um, making them in paper to making them in cloth so so there's a gradual um uh, sort of transition through the workshop and the same works with um, other things as well so for instance um, we're talking in the touch module about making 3d things and so I, I we talk about um just cutting paper and making shapes and um we I'll, I show you how to make quite a simple shape that you can manipulate and fold up and then we go into cloth and manipulate it and fold it up and before you know it you've got a piece of work that doesn't look like a piece a flat piece of paper it's a 3d piece that's been um joined cut shaped waxed maybe painted maybe maybe stitched maybe all sorts of techniques that we're putting together so i'm hoping that maybe the journey between um sketchbook and finished piece of work is going to be quite um easy to follow for people um during the workshop yeah yeah i love watching the transition that you that you take people on it it's an, it's a beautiful journey and even just some of the first real like exercises you mentioned the paper collage i just love to show a few here they're just so beautiful um really really beautiful and and relative well you make it look easy debbie let's say <laughs> It's not really that difficult. I mean, it really isn't that yeah. difficult. Um, yeah. If you've got beautiful papers that you will have painted, and um, we we make paste papers as well, which give beautiful texture. Oh, that's upside down. Oh, sorry. No, it's, it's on the side. No, that's Is okay. It? I'll forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> it's square. It's hard to know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's simple cutting and simple. Um, simple stitching uh, sometimes with machines sometimes with a hand um but you, we've got uh, as well quite simple design techniques that um i can which probably a lot of people know about already but again it's it's taking the basics and we start with the simple things and then we build on them all the way through the workshop so at the end um we're doing things i'm making you actually put all the things you've learned together into one piece at the end so um yeah yeah start yeah. start Start simple, get more difficult. Beautiful. Um, Jill says, she goes, I love writing and always think I need to spend more time on doing rather than writing. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that's probably quite right, actually, because um, you can put things into perspective in your mind if you write about them, which is quite often very good. Yeah, yeah. And Marilyn uses her sketchbooks more about writing what, I, about it, what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, well, that... Perfect. That's exactly what mine is as well. So that's very interesting. Good. Yeah. Catherine asked a question. She was wondering what tools you take with you when you go out to sketch. Okay. So um, I have a sketchbook. Uh, so yeah. I these sketchbooks, I, I make them myself. So this one's got a hard cover. I'll just reach over. Excuse me. But I also make these little paper ones and actually in the workshop I take you through making your own little sketchbooks uh, so I take a sketchbook out one that I've made either that size or quite often make them smaller and then I really like to have some wet media so I quite often have a little um, those you know those uh, pens which have got a little uh, water uh, tank in what not a tank what do you call it like a bladder yeah. Yeah, and, they're, 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 and you can squeeze them. And um, so you can use uh, wet media with them. So watercolour. So sometimes I've got a tiny little box of watercolours. I'm just seeing I've got it here. Now I have a tiny little box of watercolours. Um, I use um, water-soluble pencils and crayons. I use those quite a lot. Um, I, use, I always have a, a pencil. I, well, I normally have several pencils, uh, a hard one, a soft one, a graphite stick that I can use on the side. Um, I quite like having a something that resists the watercolour, so um, like a wax pastel or an oil pastel. Um, quite simple materials. I don't like to take too much because um, I like to just be able to slot it in my pocket or I've got a little bag, which I show you how to make in the workshop, um, um, which I take my stuff out with. And um, yeah, so a simple, simple really. And I, it, you know what it's like, things change. So some at the moment, that's what I'm taking out. But next week, maybe it'll be something different and I'll be deciding, oh, I'm just going to take an oil pastel and some colored crayons or something. So, you know, it's, um, yeah. yeah, it changes. 
And always yeah. a sketchbook and always a pen and a pencil and something coloured. Yes. Really wet. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for asking the question too. So the senses. This course is about the senses, perceiving the world and your landscape in a different way. Can you talk us through the three senses that you chose to include in this course briefly? But then I want to touch on visualising sound because that might be a concept that may be new to a lot of people watching. Mm, yes, I expect it will be. Okay, so we're, we're concentrating on three of the senses. So we're con concentrating on sight, sound and touch. I don't go into smell or taste. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't like going around tasting everything around me particularly. And yeah. although smell is quite a potent sense, um, it's a chemical sense rather than a skin sense. So we're concentrating on the skin senses. So the senses that use your skin. So eyes, ears, fingers. And we're starting with looking and that will probably be the most familiar to people because obviously as an art practice, looking is normally the thing that you do. So a lot of the things I ask you to do um, during those couple of modules will be probably the most familiar to you. And um, likewise with the touching modules, um, it's all about um, how we touch. So it's about texture and surface. It's about how the weather touches the objects in the environment and how the weather and um, the things around that are happening around us can alter and change the surface of um, materials. So that as well may not be completely different to um, other things that you've done before. But what probably will be quite different for you is um, listening, paying conscious attention to the sounds that are going around you, listening to the sounds in the distance, the sounds in the mid um, ground and the sounds right in the foreground and being able to um, visualize those in some way. Now, there's not a language for, say, for instance, the sound of that motorbike that's just passed or the sound of that plane that's going over or the sound of that blackbird that's singing. There has been no visual notation devised ever for that. Of course, writing is a very, um, is a way that we all can understand things through vision. We look at words and we can hear the words in our ears. So that's a sort of writing down um, of sounds. And if you've been a musician and you've learned how to read musical notation, that's another known way of um, documenting the sounds that you hear. But we're going to be going out and we're going to be listening to the sounds in the environment. And there is no way of being able to um, draw those or write them down. So I'm going to take you through a few exercises to show you how those sounds could be drawn. And because there's no way of actually um, writing it down, there's no notation for uh, drawing sounds with the sound of a blackbird, for instance, you have to make that up in your own mind. You have to use your imagination. You have to think, does that sound have a texture? Does that sound have a shape? Does that sound have a line? And um, so it becomes an extremely good way of you using your own imagination um, to think very creatively and to produce things to represent something that hasn't isn't normally represented visually. So um, it's going to be quite a challenging couple of uh, modules, which is, I think, not a bad thing. Um, I give a lot of information to you to make you understand it. And um, I think in the end, though, it's quite um, satisfying because you're going to be coming up with things that um, no one has really ever come up with before, because you're going to be trying to make marks. And indeed, we make holes as well. So we're making some sort of sound mark. And that is going to, for you, evoke or represent the sounds that you hear. Beautiful. Well done. <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> it does. We've got a question um, that's come through. It actually was pre-asked by Sally Tim. So thanks, Sally, and thanks, Katie, for popping it up on Sally's behalf. That's lovely. Um, we've got, Debbie, do you find that you make the same marks when you draw a sound a second time? 
like making almost a code or does the the mark vary because of other influences like weather emotions and emotion um environments oh that's really interesting oh i'm not yeah. sure i never really thought about that before yeah. right okay so yes i think when I hear a sound, so I've got one particular sound, which is that sound of the um, halyards banging against the mast, and it goes clink, 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 clink. And I know I've represented that sound in quite a few different ways, because for me, it's a sound that completely describes this environment for me. For me, if I heard that sound, I would know it anywhere. And um, changes though every day so if the wind's blowing hard the clinks are slower if um, a clinks are faster if the wind's blowing soft the clinks are slower if it's a metal boat the clinks have a different um, or a metal mast the clinks have a different um timbre you could say to the ones if they're clinking against a wooden mast so yes the the actual rhythms that i'm denoting are probably the same so the marks might be spaced similarly but because the environment is different it is possible that the marks could change quite a lot so i've made one cloth where i've made the marks in a sort of oval shape but i've made countless drawings as well of the marks being straight lines so just because you do it one way one minute doesn't mean you have to do it the same way the next minute but you'll probably find that there will be some connection between the marks whatever that might be it might be a color it might be a line it might be a space between the marks mm. what a great answer? question yeah. yeah thank you so much Sally that was amazing and I just put a couple of images up there Debbie as you were talking to yeah, yeah. represent what different soundscapes might look like um and I it would be wonderful if you could talk us through this larger sound um scape piece then you've used holes here to represent Okay, yeah. so I think this Can might be the last Italian's piece, actually. Yes. Oh, great. Can you talk about it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this is. So this is a this is in fact a moment of being. Um, so I made a whole series of works a few years back that I called moments of being collectively, and they were those ideas that I the things that I'd heard or seen that had stuck in my memory, and this was the exact. Um, uh, piece the exact sound that I was just talking about so the masts were banging against the halyards and the wind was blowing very fast and they were going ching 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 very fast lots of sound so you've got here four layers of sound and then the um and then the wind slowed down so the chink started going instead of ching 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 they started going ching 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 much more irregular. And then the wind picked up again and the chinks started um, going back to that irregular, that regular, I mean, sorry, chink, 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 chink. So this is a way of notating those sounds. So it's a way of notating the rhythms as much as anything else. And this piece is a double piece. So that means it's got a front layer and a back layer and the back layer, the holes um, imitate the front layer holds as well. But what's quite interesting is that as you move from side to side across the piece, the holes slightly change shape exactly the way that the um, sounds interact with each other when you're listening to it in the environment. So this was um, my way of notating that sound, not using a stitched mark or a drawn mark, but by actually using a hole. Wow. And that piece is just stunning. It was beautiful. You had it in your backdrop um, for half the course and then we swapped yeah. it out for another one. And it is just mesmerising. It's it's beautiful to, to look at. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So Rebecca says it's almost a form of synesthesia. It is. It, yes. Although it's not actually synesthesia. Um, I don't know whether people know what synesthesia is, but synesthesia is when you um, you take one sense into your head and it it um, in its head. It. Uh, oh, how do I. It sort of transcribes itself into another sense. So, for instance, the artist Kandinsky, he would um, 
hear sounds and see colors. So they were transcribed one, he was transcribing color into sound. And um, so, yes, it is really what you're doing is you're listening to a sound and you're transcribing it into something visual. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we had a question uh, from Marcia. She asked, do you ever use water from the streams or ocean where you are or near where you are? Yes. Good question. Yes, I do. So just out of the back of the studio is the creek which fills up with water as you saw earlier um and um i often use that water so um the piece that you've just seen the marston halliards piece um um has uh iron y iron wire eyelets sewn into it and i use iron wire because if i throw the piece into the sea the sea the salt in the sea and the other things here we go um reacts with the iron wire and it rusts it. So I very, very often um, take a piece of work, attach it quite carefully with a string and a big knot and throw it over the side of um, the deck at the back of the studio, at the back of the studio and let it soak there for a bit. And then as I take it, I take it out and hang it up. And as it hangs and dries, the water rusts, the salt water rusts the iron wire so it's a really nice way of um interacting with the environment using the um, elements around me so um and the visual the visualization of that is the rusty eyelets that, that you get at the end yeah. yeah so yes i do use the water i also just sometimes just take a bucket of water and use it for painting because actually um it works quite well really you know <laughs> yeah yeah, it's it's interesting that we're talking about, you know, we've started venturing into how we're using materials and actually Eva has asked a question. She said, the supplies are we that we're using in the workshop, are these available wherever you are living? Right. Uh, this is a great question, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so on the whole, yes. <laughs> so on the whole, everything that you will be using will be a normal art material. So pens, pencils, paper, cloth, stitch, all the things you'll be using normally. But there is one particular module where we talk about materials and using other things. So maybe things that you use for decorating the house or um, things that you might find in your garage or underneath the kitchen sink. So things like house paint. Um, I use bitumen. You may not be able to get bitumen, but I things that you get from a DIY store, really. So if you have a DIY store near you, then you'll definitely be able to find some some of these things. House paint, um, bitumen, varnish, PVA. Most people have PVA, um, some sort of plaster, you know, for filling the walls. Um, so we do go through some other materials. We use wax quite a lot, which is relatively easy to get hold of. You can use wax candles. Um, what else do we use? Um, I'm trying to think. Was there anything else? I think that was probably it, more or less. Um, but yes, so there is a module that will use non-traditional materials, you could say. Materials that you would usually usually use for decorating the house rather than making an artwork. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, it, like it's going to be exciting because wherever people live around the world taking this course, they're going to be able to find materials from their environment and share well, that with everybody yes, so that's going to be so exciting yeah so that is right so um so we you know you've got plants that are different to me um you've got perhaps earth or mud or all sorts of other things that are around you'll find objects um, because there are, we are going to be trying to collect objects so you know the objects from the countryside to the seaside to an urban environment they're going to be different everywhere we're going to be looking at how cloth is used in those environments or how other materials um, are weathered and degenerate in, in. And that's going to be different wherever you are. You know, if you live in a very hot country or a very hot place and you don't have any rain, then that, that's going to be different to if you if you live in Scotland and it's raining the whole time or, you know, or in, in the UK. So um, what you are going to be using is going to be dependent on where you are. And um, mm. nothing is out of bounds. You can use absolutely anything that 
comes to you. I show you the things that I do with the materials that have, are available to me. If those materials aren't available to you, I'm saying go out, find the materials that are available to you, um, make up a way or a process of using them. And if you can't make it up, you know, speak to me because I'll be on the Facebook page and I can put my head to it and see if we can come up with some way of using the materials that are um, around your way, really, around your Absolutely. place. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, one of your materials, Debbie, that obviously speaks to your heart and your location is salt. And these are just some examples of how the salt has weathered Debbie's work. It's it's just absolutely beautiful and her 3D work here. And, of course, your your famous salt pots, which... Um, which are really beautiful. So I I personally can't wait to see, yeah, what other people come up with. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I'd like to see what other people's version of salt is. But for me, it's salt. What is it for you? So that will be really interesting to see. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We've got a few questions and comments here, Debbie. So um, I'll pop them up on the screen. Pam has asked, has Debbie used dyes or paints for the watercolours on this piece? And I think um, that came in with the long soundscape of the, the Halliards. Okay. Um, that's acrylic paint, actually. So I do, I, I, I hardly ever dye anything. Um, I'm not a dyer. I've never spent a lot of time um, working out how to do it. I have done it. And I do do it, but I, it's not my speciality. So I am a painter and so I paint my cloths. And so I will be showing you how to paint with acrylic paints and with watercolours. So um, I paint, I use the cloth and paint most of the time. Yeah. 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 Jan has said, I taught soundscapes in music where we listened to the presence and absence of sound, where it was blocked by buildings. The kids were delighted. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. The rhythm. This is brilliant. Yeah. That's right. Well, we talk about silence as well, because you can't really talk about si sound without talking about silence. So, um, and the gaps in between the sounds, which are the silences or not silences, as you will find out. Yeah. yeah. And there is a delightful little exercise that you take people or really an experiment where you take people that involves a coat hanger, Jan. You you might be familiar with it if you've worked with kids too. So that, <laughs> that was fabulous. So, yeah, really, really great. Um, a storybook finish it says she's a kindred spirit to the creative soul who lives within me but whom yet whom I'm not yet fully introduced. Oh, that's poetic. Lovely. <laughs> well yeah and yeah it is a brilliant sensory experience yeah how does um visualizing sound and other concepts within the course like encourage imaginative thinking like you spoke about it a little bit th went through during our time together that by thinking in different ways it's going to stretch our creativity yeah that's right so the whole time I'm trying to think of ways of pulling out the creativity from my mind. And so I suppose that's what I'm trying to do with students as well. And as I mentioned just before, when we were talking about how visualizing sound is something you're doing, you're, you're, you're inventing something that you've never seen or done before. And um, I'm a great believer in making a connection between different things. So when we go out and we experience and we, gain more knowledge about things and we understand things more and I will very often do research so if I go out and see something I will look it up in a book afterwards because if you can't name something you don't see it which is quite an interesting concept isn't it concept if you go out and you don't know how to name that place or that leaf or that flower you don't really see it, but as soon as you can put a name to it, you see it. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea and I'm urging people to um, go out, notice things, um, research them, understand them more. And in doing that, they're gain gaining a lot more knowledge. And as soon as you gain more knowledge and you have more experience, then you have more to draw on when you come to be creative. So the more you go out and you listen to sounds and you use your imagination to 
um, think about how those sounds could be visualized. The more you do it, the more experience you have with doing it, and then the more you have to draw on. And so um, we, I have a lovely little um, equation that I like to use, which is experience plus knowledge equals creativity. So if you go out, you learn stuff, you notice stuff, you, you're curious and you get your pot of experience and knowledge becomes bigger, then you have more to draw on and then you have more chance of being creative. And that works for visualizing sound. That, that works as well for um, all the touch modules we do where we're, we're looking at objects and we're looking at structures and surfaces. And the more you look, the more you knowledge you gain, the more you can then pull these ideas into work that is um, new, really, and inventive. Yeah, yeah. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Susan's made an interesting comment here. Um, she said, I'm already envisaging some of the shapes and sounds in my back field and also how many techniques from other FAT courses will work in this course. I don't say that to advertise, but I say that because in many, many times, Debbie, you said sometimes we need a lot of tech or like a lot of techniques or a lot of ingredients in our cupboard to be mm -hmm. able to pull them out when inspiration strikes. So if you hear a sound, you might not be able, like it, having many techniques helps you to be able to represent that sound or that touch or... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the knowledge plus experience equals creativity. If you've got a lot to draw on, then when you hear that sound, you can say, OK, I can I can envisage that sound as a wire drawing because you might have been playing with some with some wire. And so I give you the techniques that I use in my work. I'm giving you the things that I've um, explored and tried to work on. And for me, they work in my context but for you in your context you will have completely different experiences to me you might be dyers so you might actually want to dye your cloth rather than paint it and do you know what that's absolutely fine I'm very happy for people to draw on their own experiences and in fact I'm more than happy and I think at one point I say I'm really looking forward to what you can teach me because this happens so often in workshops that I teach one thing and I suppose I'm teaching ideas as much as I'm teaching processes and people will say oh that's really interesting because I've just been doing this and I could perhaps use this technique for um, this idea so yes the workshop I think could you could say is as much an ideas workshop as this is a techniques and process um, workshop and everybody I would love I would encourage people to bring their own ideas and their own processes into the workshop as well mm, beautifully said thank you Debbie yeah before we play another video for people which is um, a video called about this course and it'll take people through um, each module and we'll show them examples some one of my personal favorite modules was towards the end of the course where you were doing waxed collages I just love them. They were beautiful. <laughs> so this, I just want to share a few images of that. Um, and and another thing I just want to um, applaud you is that you've you've taken people from like idea to a walk into a sketchbook through collage into paper, back to paper, back to 3D. Like there's just such a range of techniques and people are going to be able to take this anywhere. Um, they may not do everything or take everything uh, into their art practice as a whole moving forward, but there's going to be something in there for everybody. I think so. And it is quite possible that you may get stuck on just doing one module because they are because I my practice is quite wide and I've basically given you everything that I do. So it's quite possible that, you know, you may get stuck on the collages or you may get stuck on the drawing sound or you may get stuck on the touch and you might just want to explore that and find that um, you never get onto the making wax collage or you never get onto making the 3D. I don't know. Um, so, um, 
yeah, there has to be something for everybody here, really, uh, yeah. because I just touch on so much. But I would like to just say that um, even if you think that you're not going to like something, so if you think, oh, I'm not very good at 3D, I think I won't bother with that module, try it because I, do, I really have tried to make it so that it's quite easy to follow um it gives you an introduction to these ideas and then takes them further and further so that if you found it difficult in the past i'm really hoping that perhaps um it will be something that you might become oh might start enjoying in the future so yeah don't just you know if people do it and they think oh I don't want to do 3d i can't i can't do that because that, people often say that to me um yeah give it a go yeah. what i'd say well, you make things so accessible and and you really tell um you instruct in such a um accessible way debbie that you make anything seem possible so you can see here well if, why i've fallen in love with these wax collages they're just absolutely um, beautiful. And I was thinking about it when you were talking about, you know, your materials and your place. And I'm a beekeeper. So I have access to um, wax and I have access to this material. And it, it's something I'm very passionate about. So maybe that's why I love your wax collages so much. Yeah, too. I know. Well, I mean, lucky you for having wax just to hand. It's just that would be fantastic. I have to buy it, which is, you know, not yeah. so good. I could I wish I had some bees that I could go out and collect honey and bees wax from. That would be fantastic. Yes, yeah, it is. It is, yeah, a special <laughs> gift from nature. Mm -hmm. Debbie, um, I'm going to play your About This Cause video now. And um, again, this is new to you. You haven't seen it before. Um, I hope you enjoy it. My workshop and me is all about sensing. It's about looking, listening and touching. So I wanted to share that with you. I think if you're sensing, those senses are coming from all different parts of your body, all different parts of your environment. You need lots of different techniques quite often to be able to interpret what you're experiencing. So I'm giving you lots of different techniques. I'm sort of giving you everything that I do. I feel that this will give you the opportunity to do new things, push yourself further, get new knowledge, and to make pieces of work that you never dreamt that you could have come up with in the first place. There's something for everybody of every experience. This workshop starts quite simply. It starts with a scribble. And then we consider each of the senses independently. We start with sight, then we go into sound, and then we go into touch. Every time we start a new sense, we do a walk outside in the environment. During that walk, you'll be documenting your experiences using that particular sense. The place a lot of my students get stuck is they go out and they draw in their sketchbooks and then they think, what do I do now? It's sort of like, it's a sticking point quite often. They can't get from the sketchbook to the piece of work. So I'm trying to get over that barrier from sketchbook to final piece of work. In the site module, we're going to make a book. So I'm going to be teaching you some book binding techniques. I'm also going to be teaching you some watercolor techniques and some painting techniques. We're then going to go on and do some collages and we're going to talk about colour mixing and painting papers and we'll make some paste papers which are jolly good fun and then we're going to be putting them together and we'll cover off the design ideas, probably things that you know quite well. And then we're going to do some mark making related to the sounds. And I'll take you through the exercises and explain what we're going to do. So if it's something that you're not quite sure about, I'm there to help you. Then we take the sound marks and we interpret those sound marks in stitch. And I'll be teaching you some techniques and processes to do that. I teach you lots of different ways of making holes and I'm going to encourage you to make a holy cloth that represents sounds. And then we're going to think about touch. And you're going to look at how cloth is used in the environment, how it's weathered, and using those observations to use various materials and techniques to weather the cloth, to erode it, 
to even protect it. You'll be making some small pockets and some small vessels and they will be all very tactile. And when we've done all of that, I'm going to give you even more. I'm going to give you more techniques that extend some of the things we've done. So where we've done paper collage, I'm going to show you how to use cloth and wax to make collages. And then where we've made 3D objects in the shape of a vessel, I'm going to be showing you how we can start with a flat piece of paper or cloth and we can fold them up and manipulate it into a 3D object. There's a lot to think about and a lot to do, but I guide you all the way through it. I give you a lot of the techniques that I use in my work and you can work through it at your own speed. So you would end up with a fantastic body of work. My hope for the student is that they can take their own personal experiences, their own personal likes and dislikes, and pour all those ideas into the things that you're making with me. That will make the work very personal to you. And of course, I'm really looking forward to meeting you all during our live Q and A's and on the Facebook forum. And if you have questions for me then that you feel are tricky or you don't understand, then I'm there for you and I will do my best to answer them. I really look forward to sharing this journey with you. Fantastic. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> oh dear, have I frozen? Looks like we've lost Ange there, Debbie. That was. So I thought maybe I'd lost, she'd lost me. I was getting worried. I thought uh, it looks like for a minute there she had a tear in her eye. <laughs> I thought maybe she's just taking a moment. <laughs> Oh dear, she's disappeared. Never mind. I know, she, she'll jump back in. Oh, that was so beautiful, Debbie. I was telling my friend, I showed I showed one of my friends that, and she she's she will admit she says I'm not a non I'm not an arty person, and she actually had goosebumps and tears watching that. It's just so beautiful. Well, uh, yes, I do cover off a lot of the things that I do, and I'm really hoping that people will enjoy, you know, joining me on the sort of. I don't like using that word, okay. you know, that journey of, of, you know, trying out things and, and, and experimenting, because a lot of it will be about experimenting. But, oh, you're back. Good. <laughs> I think it's a collaboration. I think yeah. that's what Ange and I felt when we filmed with you. It was just such a beautiful collaboration with you. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Anyway. It was a very, very um, exciting time. Uh, utterly exhausting by the last day I was sort of like oh I can't think I can't say anything more but um yeah it was fab it was fabulous so I'm I'm really hoping that uh people will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it so, oh. yeah, together yeah I'm really glad my power went out um sorry about that um, yeah. I thought it was me for a minute and I thought oh no <laughs> don't you hide in the background there Deborah I am so <laughs> I'm glad that happened because what I wanted to say was thank you to Debs who sits behind the scenes in, in most of these interviews but who came out filming on her first um, filming adventure with us and did an outstanding job helping um, and supporting Debbie throughout the course. I'm and sorry about that, Debs. Yes, I said, come on, my, my assistant here. <laughs> yes. <She's> oh. <laughs> so it was such an amazing experience. It really was, oh, my gosh, a highlight of my life for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fantastic um did the video finish playing or did it cut out as well that was perfect no. okay yep. good. yeah great well um thank you thanks Debs. thank you deborah um amazing um that we could do that sorry I, I i dropped out there for a bit but um it was a perfect perfect conclusion probably to get De um debbie in there and to say thank you and look if anyone's got any last minute questions um please feel free to email us. Um, enrolments for Sensing Place will be opening in one week, just a little under one week. And we've put a link up there for the um, 
registration. So what happens when you register is that you pop your email address in and we send you some beautiful behind the scenes videos um, of Debbie Tate talking actually through some more of the concepts around the course. Um, so it's a beautiful little email series. We'd love you to, to get to know Debbie a bit more. Um, and of course, check out Debbie's website as well. Um, yeah, we can't wait to release this course and it's going to be absolutely fabulous. Um, one quick question from Pam. Um, will your Fragments book be available again? Uh, she missed it the first time around. Yes. It will. I'm, it's um, it's being reprinted at the moment. I'm hoping to receive the copies next week. And also, actually, I've also reprinted my Moments of Me one. So um, hopefully that will be in my shop next week as well. So, uh, yes, I've, I've, I've had um, 100 of each printed. So uh, you have to get in there quite quickly and I'll see if I can get some more reprinted if, um, if they sell out. So that's what she said. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Well, everybody who's still watching, thank you so much for joining and staying through to the end. Your great questions and comments and support, as always, is amazing. Um, pop some love in for Debbie. We'll play our exit slideshow as we normally do. And, yeah, can't wait to see you all in the course. It's going to be fabulous. Thanks, Debs, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's been great. <laughs> yeah, it's been fabulous. Just such a yeah. pleasure.